The Canola School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by BSF Canada and Invigor Hybrid Canola. Hello, I'm Lara Demozak, and welcome to another Real Agriculture's Canola School episode. Joining me today is Dr. Brianne Tideman, Research Scientist at Agriculture and Agafood Canada at Lacombe. How are you today? I'm doing good, Lara. How are you? I'm good. So we're going to talk about some herbicide carryover risk, particularly in canola. Yeah. And the first question I have for you is, which herbicide active ingredients are canola varieties most sensitive to? So there's there's obviously been a lot of talk about the IMI herbicides, imazepir and imazamox, um, particularly with the notices that have been released recently. And canola is, of course, quite susceptible to them. Um, but I would also keep an eye on on any herbicide active ingredients that have residual, particularly those that are known to control canola. There's other residual products that maybe don't work as well on canola, that may not be such a, a big risk, like a peroxisulfone doesn't have a lot of volunteer canola efficacy or brassica efficacy. Um, but I would say the immies are, are certainly ones that are, are generating a lot of concern and a lot of discussion, I think is a kind word for it right now. Yeah. So, so we can understand why, you know, there's drought, extreme heat, yes. there's no soil moisture. Why and how does herbicide carryover risk happen? So herbicides are broken down in in different ways. Um, some of it is, you know, degradation by the sun. So the, the sun and the heat that we got this summer is a good thing. Yeah. But a lot of our our residual herbicides are microbial breakdown. Right. And the conditions that are the conditions that are good for microbe growth are usually those that are also good for crop growth. So if you haven't had good crop growth, you probably also haven't had a lot of microbes. Um, the other thing is how, how herbicides interact with soil and, and plant uptake and all of that. So if there's no moisture in the soil, then the herbicides are typically stuck to the soil particles, right? Yeah. There has to be moisture for the herbicide to sort of dissolve into that soil solution and be available for uptake. So when there's been no moisture for months, a lot of that herbicide is probably still stuck on the soil particles because when they're stuck there, they're not available for the microbes to eat, even if there were microbes to eat. Well, I mean, just speaking from my own experience, they're, they're definitely the microbes still there. Um, yes. They're dormant, most likely, but if yeah. they don't have any moisture, they can't uh, respire and produce those enzymes that break down that herbicide residue. And then, of course, there you go. See, you have the soil knowledge. <laughs> I've got the herbicides. Absolutely, <laughs> we're working together on this. I talk very generally here about the soils. So, and, microbes, and, the, yeah. and the soil texture also plays into it. So, if you have a more clay-based soil, if you have higher clay content, then you're going to have. Uh, you're also generally going to have more organic matter and more micro microbial composite or community in your soil. So it all it all yeah. works together. Exactly, yeah. because at the same time, if you've got more organic matter, the herbicide is more likely to be bound to the organic matter as well. Yeah. The organic matter can act as a buffer as well, right? In a sense. It can act as a buffer as well as a deposit zone almost in a yeah. sense. Yeah. In in Lacombe, we had an interesting occurrence actually of, of herbicide carryover a few years ago, which we normally don't see because we've got a higher organic matter. We're not typically... We get good moisture. We've got high organic. Matter. We're not typically a high risk area, but we had had drought the year before, and then we had a really heavy rainfall come through, and all of a sudden we started seeing carryover issues. And it most likely was that where the organic matter normally buffers some of that that breakdown and and that carryover, so much of it actually got released from the organic matter because of the amount of moisture that came down that we actually saw carryover issues in Lacombe where we normally don't. Yeah, that's a really good point, which kind of segues into the, my next question for you. What about areas that have had enough moisture? What, or what about areas that they maybe have their own weather stations and can prove they've got enough, they've had enough precipitation for the last growing season? 
interesting question. And I, I guess, you know, part of my question would be how, how risk averse are you? Um, you know, if, if you have documentation that you had 200 mils of rain and it shouldn't be an issue for you, great. But if you do have an issue, if you lose your crop, you know, how, how much fighting are you really willing to go through to, to prove that point, to prove that you didn't have that risk? And, and is it worth it to, to risk losing that crop and those seed inputs and whatever else and have to fight to get compensation? Or is it easier to just make an adjustment to your cropping plans? I, I know I've seen a lot of, you know, some of the kickback, the arguments that it's, it's not ideal, this timing, why didn't we know this earlier? You know, it, it you can only so know, know so much at spray time. That's just how it goes. Yeah. You, do, you don't know what the, the growing season is going to be like. And that goes for any residual product. Yeah. You're, you're always taking a risk using a residual product. Yeah. And it's, it's not ideal to find out now, but it's a whole lot better finding out now than when your crops all die, in my opinion. So, I mean, if, if you have, have the hard data and, and you're a gambling person, I guess all the power to you. Perhaps, but perhaps, yeah. I, I don't know that it would necessarily be worth the risk. Yeah. Because then you even get into, I mean, different areas of your field that might have a different pH or a different texture. So yeah. you might have patchy carryover, even though you had enough rain technically. And it just, it's a big risk to take. Yeah. Which, especially are- after a, a low income year. Yeah. And so, uh, if you were a little bit risk averse, or even if you're not, maybe you just want to know for sure uh, what kind of risk you're carrying towards 2022. Um, can you test soil for carryover risk right now? Is fall the best time? Should you wait till spring? What are your thoughts on that? So do, doing a test for carryover risk, um, normally what you would do is is plant a very sensitive crop. Um, most of the herbicide labels actually suggest doing that a year ahead of your planned planting time. So some of the labels that I've seen for for something like lentils or um, sugar beet are, are notoriously sensitive to, to herbicide residues. Um, talks about planting it the year prior. And we're talking planting into a soil sample. Planting into a soil sample or planting in a strip in the field the next oh. the year before you're going to seed in there. Right. Um, the question of fall versus spring, um, I guess that gets into, again, how how much do we trust the forecast on how much snow we're going to get in terms of how much runoff? Is it going to be an early spring? How soon are those soils going to warm up? Yeah. If we have a late spring and not much snow moisture, you probably could do a very accurate bioassay type, take a soil sample, grow something sensitive, see if there's any damage. If we get a lot of snow melt, if we get an early spring, those soils warm up early, we might see more degradation. <laughs> How are all those things going to play together? Yeah. Is it, it a question mark? It, yeah. Yeah. I would say it's a big question mark. So, I mean, you, you can do a grow out bioassay. I, I don't know that I would stake an entire field or an entire crop on it, to be completely honest. Yeah. As we know, soils are highly variable and we're in a dry bias and I think that the cycle of the, of these dry years isn't quite finished yet. The last forecast that I saw for our winter was a low snowfall winter as well. So um, yeah, I I don't know. I, I don't know that I would risk it. I think I would take a serious look at, you know, what the recropping restrictions are for any residual herbicide that I've used. Again, not, just the Emmys, but any residual herbicide that you've applied, take a very close look at those recropping restrictions because almost every label is going to have something on there about in extreme drought conditions that damage can occur after those re after those planted months type mm-hmm. of thing. Um, and take a very close look at what crops are, you know, recommended for recropping three months after versus nine months versus 12 months versus 22 months type of thing and and make some decisions that way because there just is inherent risk with residual herbicides. Yeah. Keep track of your records, have a look at them, make some planning decisions for 2022. Yeah. 
Thanks so much for your time today, Brianne. Thanks. Thank you.